This week's media review looks at one of the most popular shows on American television, the hit ABC show Scandal. Scripted by one of Hollywood's most famous screenwriters, Shonda Rhimes, who is also the screenwriter behind the top-rated television show Grey's Anatomy, Scandal is perhaps the epitome of Obama-era popular culture. The show is all about upper-middle-class professionals, politically connected lawyers and spin artists who work on a series of problems each week that they vow to make disappear for their rich and successful clients. It's not that they don't care about the poor working-class people, it's just that those people are invisible and couldn't afford their fees anyway. In this case, the professionals are a somewhat mysterious team of almost superhero fixers led by the highly capable, manipulative and iron-willed hero, Olivia Pope, played by Kerry Washington. Pope embodies the television trope of the guile hero, someone who consistently prevails through her intuitive genius and her ability to manipulate the bad guys. Pope is based upon the real-life personage of Judy Smith, press aide to George Bush Sr., who is, like the president in the fictional universe of Scandal, a moderate Republican by today's standards. Smith went on to put together a crisis management firm rather like the one in the show, and she is a co-executive producer on the programme, so the series can be seen as one huge vanity project. This is also where the show's politics are flagged up. First of all, Scandal is colourblind, the lead star is a black woman involved in a complex relationship with a white Republican president. This is, as The New Yorker points out in their article Primary Colours, the first network TV drama with a black female lead character since 1974. Yet there is almost no direct reference to race in the storylines. Almost everything that happens in the show is tacitly structured by race. The only enduring storyline is the romantic relationship between Pope and President Grant, who is not just white himself, but sits at the apex of a power structure built by white supremacy. But if this is supposed to make any difference to events, as it would in life, it is the subject of an artful silence. Second, it's explicit political commitments of those of the president who, though a white Republican, could just as well be Obama. They're socially liberal, but otherwise utterly conservative and utterly orthodox. Third, the show makes a lot of its ostentatious feminist commitments. While race is strangely subdued, gender is foregrounded throughout the series. But it's a strange kind of feminism that often falls back on sexist cliches. Finally, insofar as the show is focused on two elite worlds, that of crisis management for rich delinquents and that of a venal Oval Office, the portrait it offers of the American ruling class is strangely both admiring and repulsive. In the first series, the show is traditionally patriotic. Take episode four of season one about El General, or General Flores, a political freedom-hating leftist dictator who is also a sworn enemy of the United States. The character is evidently modeled on the standard American fantasy of Hugo Chavez. Of course, El General. Who is it? General Benicio Flores. Otherwise known as ruthless, repressive, political freedom-hating, police brutality-loving, South American leftist dictator. And sworn enemy of the United States. The story at first seems to slightly humanize Flores, who, despite ranting in a typical caricatured fashion, is also the evident target of a kidnapping plot when his wife and child go missing. It transpires that his wife was not kidnapped, but fled because she didn't love him anymore and feared him too much just to walk away. As his wife explains her plight, she relates that she once loved the general, who was a good man before he became paranoid, thinking that everyone is out to get him so that if you disagree with him, you disappear. But now Benicio thinks everyone's out to get him. You disagree with him, you disappear. You don't tell a man like that you're unhappy. You don't ask a man like that for a divorce. Obviously, it is beyond the scope of a program like this to question whether a left-wing leader of any Latin American country might have good reason to be paranoid. And the political tone of the episode is set by President Grant delivering some sententious drivel about democracy to the organization of American states. So General Flores, President Chavez, and President Castro, all those who would seek to squash individual rights and freedoms may hear us. Your time has passed. But this revelation leads Pope to side with Flores' wife and to blackmail the general into giving up custody of his children, threatening to lead a chorus of international denunciation and a campaign for women's rights in the developing world if he doesn't. 
I know, I know she's your wife. I know she's the mother of your children, and I know she seems weak now, but she is smart. She is powerful. And smart, powerful women like Carolina, they don't curl up and hide when they've been wounded. They strike back by writing memoirs and appearing on talk shows and at benefits and on red carpets, talking about women's rights in the developing world and how babies were ripped from her arms by a ruthless dictator who can't run a family, much less a country. This is where the moral ambiguity of the character becomes a little more like self-righteous monstrosity. As a rich and influential American, she feels entitled to intervene in someone else's family affairs in defiance of what she acknowledges is the law and separate a man from his children on the basis of knowing almost nothing about the situation because her gut told her to. And that leads into some questions about the show's very ostentatious feminism. Shonda Rhimes' insistence on putting feminism front and center of scandal is admirable. But what kind of feminism does the program endorse? In series one, Olivia Pope's strength of character as a woman is partly established by the fact that she will not accept terms like lose, and she doesn't believe in crying. Well, don't let Olivia see you doing that. She doesn't believe in crying. She doesn't believe in... What is that? Who says that? Olivia. She says that. This sounds a lot like the culture of a testosterone-driven college locker room, but that's in part because at heart, Olivia Pope is the embodiment of the entrepreneurial ethic. In series three, the show introduces Montana Congresswoman and would-be presidential candidate Josie Marcus, played by Lisa Kudrow. She is baited in coded language as being somehow not good enough to be president, and Marcus delivers a cutting rebuke to her interlocutors, defending herself against the misogynist. It's not about experience, James. It's about gender. Reston's saying, I don't have the balls to be president, and he means that literally. It's offensive. It's offensive to me and to all the women whose votes he's asking for. But the way in which she does so is, again, surprisingly macho. She points out that she has spent seven years in the armed forces more than her opponent, as if female strength can only be ratified by its ability to emulate traditional masculine social roles. Then there was Pope's relationship with President Grant. If ever there was a relationship that was thoroughly conventional in gender terms, this is it. For while Pope is powerful, it turns out in season three that she dreams of nothing more august than being married to Grant and bearing his children. Liv, I am going to marry you. We are going to have babies. Two babies, I think. <laughs> Ultimately, the supposed feminism of the program is at first very upper class and career oriented, and in the end, very conservative and very traditional. And the basic fantasy structuring the show, far more important than the supposed feminism, is that race doesn't matter. It's easy to see why some reviewers are impressed by the colorblindness of the affair. As a reviewer in the Huffington Post put it, as I watch Olivia and Fitz's steamy, passionate affair play out before me, it doesn't even dawn on me what a prominent interracial relationship this is. Finally, we meet a strong character who is undefined by racial background. Anyone can be her. Anyone can relate to her. However, this identification is bought quite cheaply. After all, why is it so difficult for someone who isn't black to identify with a character who not only is black, but experiences all the difficulties that that brings. And why can't American television deal with that? Why has it taken this long even to have a black female lead? Doesn't this in itself belie the colorblind fantasy? What's more, as the show goes on struggling to remain interesting, its colorblind world is also clearly a ruthlessly competitive individualist one. It's not just that everyone is at least amoral, such as the president's chief of staff, Cyrus Bean, whose actions range from vote rigging to ordering the murder of a White House aide whom Grant has got pregnant, that could be understood as a political critique. In fact, many of the apparent heroes of the show also turn out to be vicious killers and torturers when the job requires it, from the ex-CIA man Huck to Quinn, who was inducted into Pope's firm as a wide-eyed stray, and yet by season two, is found cheerfully torturing a former chief of staff who has himself recently coldly stabbed someone to death with a pair of scissors. 
an experience which gives her a huge adrenaline rush and leaves her dangerously bloodthirsty. The gore in the show is not just an attempt to make things more interesting. It appears to be the logical, dark underside of a fictional universe in which the law of all social life is ruthless, backstabbing competition. High-functioning sociopathy is the implied ideal. It would be a shame to give the impression that the only thing wrong with Scandal is its politics. The show is utter garbage. Despite the high production values and a fairly high quotient of gore, it is boring because it is badly scripted and trite, with more ham than a farmer's market. The only genuine fizz in the show comes through in its occasional rebelliousness against the pathetic patriarchs of the Republican right and the Tea Party. But those pitiful characters, bad as they are, are nowhere near as dangerous and unpleasant as the bourgeois heroes of the programme. And perhaps that's the show's realism.